Thank you. You may be seated. It is a joy and a privilege to be in God's house. It's always uh, just fun to be around God's people, and I do appreciate you guys so much. If you're happy to be here, say amen. amen. And, uh, and I'm just looking forward to see what God has for us tonight. It was a wonderful day this morning already, and I've been encouraged by it. We just sang the song, Nothing Between, and as we learned this morning, the only way to get to that place where there's nothing between is we're going to have to be honest with ourselves. And so were you honest with yourself today? I hope that you were, and you've come back, and you're refreshed, and you're ready to go and hear what God has for you this evening. So open up your heart and open up your mind, if you would, please, and just be prepared. Now, maybe that might mean that you needed to get to a Baptist nap. So did you get your Baptist nap? Come on, because you can't do it uh, tonight, all right? Now, uh, <laughs> so I'll be watching, okay? Uh, Brother Beckham can't uh, get up and down the stairs because of the foot problem we talked about this morning, but I'll be watching. I'll come stand next to you. No, I'm just teasing, of course. We'll have, we're going to have a good time tonight. Brother Beckham, we're so happy you're here with us. And come on up, brother, and open up God's word and share with us tonight what God has laid upon your heart okay, so that sir. he can lay it on our heart and teach us and instruct us tonight. All right. We love you, brother. I love you, preacher. God bless you, sir. Amen always say to the pastor of the church, I love you, but it's not just words. I really do love the men of God, but church, I love you too. Amen. Yeah, we are to love one another and care for one another. I, 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 I really got tickled a few minutes ago as the choir was coming down and I saw one of the, one of the, I guess one of the biggest men in the church hugging everybody and bumping everybody going down there. and I thought now that's that's the way it should be amen we should have fun in the house of the Lord amen and I hope that you did this morning I enjoyed I enjoyed bringing the word of God even though the message this morning was pretty tough right pretty tough to listen to but you know we all need it don't we whether we need it to get right or need it to be reminded that we need to take care of some things. Amen. And so tonight, let me call your attention back to the book of Colossians, chapter 3. And we'll be in the book of Colossians all week long. And um, it's a wonderful, wonderful book. Matter of fact, the whole Bible is a wonderful book. <laughs> Amen. Colossians, chapter 3. If you'll stand with me for the reading of the word. And that song, Abba, Father, oh my soul, what a song. You know what Abba means? Daddy, Papa. Yeah, get real personal with him. I, uh, when, when I'm in my closet and it's just my father and, and myself, I, I said, Papa, Daddy. I use those terms when I get along with him. Amen. Let's read the word. If, since, ye then be risen with Christ. Since you're in the family of God. Since you're saved. There are some things you need to do. And then he said, since you have been risen with me. Seek those things which are above. Where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection, set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. We are not to be earthly. We are not to be fleshly. We are to be spirit-minded. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, I hope you can say that tonight, Christ is my life. He's everything to me. There is nothing more important to me than God. Paul could say that. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. What a day. Mortify. Put to death. Crucify. Put to dead. Therefore, your members, which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, 
inordinate affections, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. For which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience, in the which ye also walked sometimes when ye lived in them. But, but now, he also put off all of these. Why? It's because you have been risen with Christ. Put off all of these. Anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man. Father, I love you. I thank you for the opportunity to be able to travel across the nation and out of this country and be able to preach your word and, and see people get right with you and see people birthed into your family. What an honor. And Lord, I, I am so thankful that you chose me to do that. And, Lord, I want to be a blessing to this church in the next few days if, if you give us more than today. And, Lord, I want to be very loving, very caring, very sensitive. Because there's some hurting people here. There's people here that are struggling with the things I preached about this morning. And, Lord, I pray from the bottom of my heart that you will help those folks to be honest and just roll those burdens upon you tonight because Lord you can take care of them you want to but we have to do our part too but Lord I thank you now I pray in closing, for the salvation of lost souls. If there's one in this room, I pray they'll be saved tonight before they leave. We love you. Thank you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Let's review for a few moments. I said this morning... Those of you that are born again, you're in the family of God. Do you realize that there are some things that you got to do? Do you realize that? Do you realize these things in the book of Colossians are not options? There are not things that you can do if you feel like it or you have time to do it. But these are things that a Christian will do because they have been risen with Christ. And in my meetings, I find out sometimes people have not even thought about seeking, the sin of not seeking God. Do you know it's a sin? Anything God tells you and me to do and we don't do it, guess what? That is a sin. The Bible says in James 4, 17, if we know to do good and doeth it not, it's sin. And so if we know that the Bible says since you have been risen with Christ, you are to be a seeker. You are to be seeking God. You are to be seeking God, number one, in your life. And see, if you're not doing that, there is no way you're going to have a desire to pray without ceasing. And the you're not going to have a desire to pray everywhere because you're in sin. And you, when you're in sin, you don't want to be around Papa. You don't want to be around Daddy because you're not doing what, what, he's, what he's told you to do. And so here it is. It's very plain. And all you have to do is be honest tonight and ask yourself, am I, am, am I doing that? Am I carrying out Matthew 6, 6, seek ye first the kingdom of God? Am I really doing that as a believer and, and, and being not just a believer but a, but a real Christian? Am I really doing that in my life? And see, if you, if, and just answer yourself. Just answer yourself to yourself. And if the answer is no, guess what? it would be good for you to just bow your head come to the altar and say God forgive me 
and help me to learn to seek you, not just during revival time, but seek you on a daily basis, putting you number one every day in my life. And then it talks about, and I talked about this morning, uh, setting our affection on things, uh, uh, on things of heaven, on, on, on godly things. And I asked you this morning, what are you thinking about? What are you thinking about? So I asked you again tonight, what are you thinking about right now? And I said that about 15, 16 years ago in a morning service in South Carolina, Simpsonville, South Carolina, and a lady stood up in the, in the South. They do a lot of that. And, and she stood up and just ran across the auditorium, went straight to the pastor's wife, put her arms around her and said, I have been gossiping about you. I have been talking about you and I want you and the pastor's wife had no idea that the lady was mad at her and she said of course I'll forgive you and revival broke out uh, and I was there a number of weeks and don't get scared if you do things like that we don't want you to stay around here seven or eight weeks uh, but but listen but things like that happen sometimes and 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 that lady just ran across the church got right with God and because her thinking was was not right she was standing over there looking at the pastor's wife at the very moment that I made that statement the Holy Spirit went wow and he's speaking to you lady and the lady ran across got right things right and then it went over to a major in the army and he was standing on the front row and he realized he hadn't spoken to his dad in 10 years and he he looked up at me and he looked down he looked at me he looked down he looked at the aisle and out the door he went and got things right with daddy amen that's so if you're here tonight and you claim to be risen with Christ, you claim to be a Christian, not just a believer, but a Christian. Listen, you can't be a Christian unless you're seeking God first and unless your focus is right. Hello? Your focus has got to be right. And then to be able to stand and say, listen, church, Christ is my life. I can do that. I can honestly do that. But there was a time in my life I could not do that. And, and God had to get my number. And let me tell you, he can get your attention real quick. My wife was very healthy as far as we knew. We did not know she had cancer in third stage. We did not know she was going to die in two and a half years. We did not know an intelligent, an intelligent, beautiful, talented lady was going to be a 13-year-old kid again. None of that we knew. But I'll tell you what, it got my attention. It got me back in the prayer closet. It got me back seeking God. It got me back focused again, and it got me back to the point that I could say, listen, he is my life. And I have said that all over the nation, out of the nation, in foreign countries in the last 20 years, because I want people to know I love God. I'm not just a church member. I'm not just someone that goes around preaching the Bible. I'm a Christian. I, I love my father. I want to talk to him all the time. Amen. I want to do what the Bible tells me. And then when I come to verse 5, when it says mortify, it, that's exactly what it means, mortify. Now look up here. This is very important, very important. This verse is very important. This verse right here, if, if this verse would, would be carried out, just this one verse, our churches would get cleaned up. Amen? It would get clean. See, God cannot use a dirty vessel. God cannot use a dirty church. And you can, you can stand and, and talk about how loving your church is and, and how spiritual it is and all of this. But really, the only person you need to be thinking about is you. Let me ask you a question. If this church was just like you, every member in this church was just like you, lived the life that you lived every day just like you, think just like you, Talk just like you, read the Bible the same amount of time as you do, pray the same amount of time you pray. He, if this church, everybody in it was just like you, what kind of church would you have? That's pretty plain, isn't it? 
Yeah, yeah, pretty plain. If this church was just like you, what kind of church would you have? And, um, and then we got on a fornication this morning. We talked about these sexual sins, and, and these, are, these are things. And you say, well, Paul was talking to a church here, Brother Beckham, and he was having to deal with fornication and uncleanness and, and, and all these things in a local church, in a Bible-believing church. Yes, he was. He's really, and, and let me tell you, I, I deal with churches all every week of my life. I'm somewhere preaching the gospel. And I use this message a lot in churches. And, uh, and, and, and as, I, as I look around the auditorium as I preach, I told a man this morning that when God saved Brother Beckham at age 16, he gave me discernment, a lot of it. I didn't use it properly. I'm not proud of, of, of my first years in the ministry, the first 10, 15, 20 years. I'm not, I'm not proud of it. Uh, uh, I, I, have, I have asked God to forgive me the way I use that discernment. But, but I can just look across the auditorium, and I can tell you sometimes he's an alcoholic. He's dabbling with, with pornography. He's addicted deeply in the pornography. He's a drug addict. He said, just by watching, watching the countenance, looking at the face, the face of a man that is an alcoholic, and you know this, is, is, it, it just looks different than a face of anybody else, an alcoholic. And he gives himself away. By his countenance. Same way with pornography. They have a look that nobody else has. And when I look across the churches of America, I see that when, when preachers tell me that's the number one sin, I deal with men in my church and ladies in my church and, and teenagers and even little children. Every week, Brother Beckham, I'm having to deal with that stuff. I believe it. I believe it because I too see it. And after the services many times, and this morning was no different, men came and said, Brother Beckham, I, I, I'm having trouble with this particular sin, and I, I need for you to pray. And I always say, I'll pray for you. And I always have time for that person. I don't get too busy to, to sit down on them and, and put my arms around them or, or shake their hand and listen to them. Because it, it, it's a terrible sin. It will destroy you. Amen? And now, tonight, I want you to look in verse 8, 9, and 10. There's another sin in our churches that are destroying our churches other than alcohol, drugs, and, and pornography. And it's, what are they? Let me read them to you again. In verse 8, anger, wrath malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man. Since you have been risen with Christ, you shouldn't be so violent in your behavior. Amen. You shouldn't blow up at home. You shouldn't Knock holes in the wall. One night, this man came into the service, and I knew that he had had an argument with his family before he got there because of his behavior. And he was sitting over to my left, and I got on this particular part, and, and, and the Holy Spirit said, just go down there and love on that man for a little bit. I went down. I, I started talking to him and patting him on the shoulder and letting him know I love him because I, I was getting ready to, to tell him what the book was said about his behavior. And, and I said, uh, Brother, you look very unhappy. He said, I am. I said, uh, I can tell. I can tell you're very unhappy. And he said, Brother Beckham, before I came tonight, I put my fist through the wall. I got so angry with my wife, and honey, I'm sorry, children, I'm sorry, and daddy's just been having a hard time, and, 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 and I let it get the best of me. I'm sorry. I said, you put your hand through the wall? He said, I did. I said, 
do you know anything about sheetrock work? He said, no. I said, do you know anything about painting? I, he said, no. I said, well, are you going to leave the hole in the wall? He said, no, I'm going to have to hire somebody. I said, so you, let me tell you, my background is painting and sheetrock. That's what my dad did for a living. And he brought me up in those trades. That's expensive. And your, your anger is going to cost you about three or $400. And he said, really? I said, yeah. I said, it would have been much better to just got over it. I said, did it hurt your hand? He said, yeah, I almost hit the two by four in the wall. I said, that would have been another $1,000 if you had had to go to the hospital. I said, so what would be best is if you would just take care of that anger. Don't blow up. Amen? Make careful, be careful what you say because she might not wake up in the morning where you can tell her you love her. You might, you might better think about this thing. Amen? See, since you have been risen with Christ, I said to him, uh, the Bible says you are to put that stuff off. That stuff shouldn't even be in your life as a Christian. And church, it should, anger should not even be a part of any of our lives. We should live every day as peaceful as we can. Amen? Anger should not be a part of our life. Let me say that again. It should not be there. And, and I want you to notice in Ephesians 4 and verse 26 and 27, the Bible says, Be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go, go down upon your wrath. And let me tell you, you get mad at your, your spouse and you fly off to handle, and then during the night she dies or he dies, or they might get killed going to work, and, you're not, and you don't have that opportunity to say, Honey, I didn't mean what I said last night. I could give you hundreds of examples. I could give you phone numbers. I have permission to do that. To give you phone numbers of people that learn that 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 lesson the hard way, and then they then they want to cry over their bot dead body at, and give them flowers, and they want to do all. The, why can't we learn to give people our flowers while they're alive? Why why can't we learn to give people the candies while they're alive and can enjoy it? Amen. Why do we have to wait until they die? To give them flowers and to give them candies and give them words of encouragement and to say, I love you. Well, Brother Beckham, that's, you know, that's for dating. You know, when we're dating, we, we say we love one another and all of that. But when we get married, you know, I no, I don't know. When we get married, it ought to, it ought to grow. Amen. Yeah, I, I pastored a boy I called Romeo. Romeo. And, uh, boy, he was, he was a pretty boy. You know what a pretty boy is? His hair was like Elvis, and, and every, I mean, everything was perfect. He would come into the church, and I would say, How you doing, Romeo? He said, Oh, preacher, don't call me that. And I said, That's what you are. You're Romeo. You're a pretty boy. And uh, he would go on in the church, you know, sit down. And during the preaching, if I wanted to get a laugh out of people, I was say, oh, Romeo down here, and the church would bust out laughing. But he got married. He dated this girl, and it, it, he gave her flowers and candy almost every week, opened the door. He did all of this good stuff. I mean, he was the ideal Romeo. But he got married. I, I performed his ceremony. And, and, you know, nowadays they give you a little bag of rice about like this. Nah, I wanted a 25-pound bag. And when they walked out that back door, I just poured it all over them. So, I, so Romeo had this rice all over him, and he got so excited about being married, he, he, he ran around, got in the car, and his bride was standing there tapping on the glass. Oh, and he ran around, opened the door. I said, it's too late, Romeo. You haven't been married five minutes, and you're already an old man. Yeah, that's the way we do. 
We forget. We, our love ought to grow, amen, one another. As we learn to learn, to learn more, more about every day. I was married to Diane 31 years, and you know, I was just really getting to the point of knowing Diane. And then she went to heaven. And then God gave me Jeanette, and I'm just now almost six years getting to know her. But I want to love her. And I want to love people. Why? Because the Bible says to. But it says here, if I'm angry, I'm not going to love. Put off anger. What is anger? Listen to this. Be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. And then there is the sin of malice. What is that, preacher? It's deep-seated feelings against the person. Hatred, hatred that lasts on and on. Intense, long-lasting bitterness against the person. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians 14, 20. We have so many people sitting in churches that holding grudges against one another. And the Bible says that should not be happening Everybody in the church house should love one another. Amen. We shouldn't, we shouldn't have these deep-seated feelings about one another. I have seen people. I love to sit up on the platform before, before the service ever start. It's amazing. Sometimes I even chuckle, but sometimes it's not anything to chuckle about. And I'll sit and I'll watch people. And one Sunday in this church, this couple walked in, and they were walking around shaking hands and bumping each other and doing, you know, just enjoying one another. And all of a sudden, this other couple walked in, and they started walking down the aisle, and they saw that other couple uh, laughing and rejoicing uh, about being in. And you know what they did? I watched them. They turned around and walked all the way around the church. Instead of walking by that couple where they would have to say, oh, good morning, how are you doing? Because that couple had, was the kind that loved to hug, and they loved to say, I love you. And they were not ready to hear, I love you. So they walked all around the church. And I had the honor to preach that morning. And guess what I preached on? Yes, sir, I did Colossians chapter 3 and verse 1 down to verse 5. And then the Holy Spirit let me to get into verse 8, 9, and 10. And guess who I looked at the whole time I was preaching? To that couple. Amen. And guess what? They got, got some help. And uh, they didn't have, that's, that, that was a long ways. They didn't have to exercise that much after that. They could just come straight down the aisle, you know. Uh, malice, it's a terrible thing. It gets into your system and messes you up. Look in 1 Corinthians 14, 20. The Bible says, brethren, be not children. That's, that's acting like a child. Uh, be not like children in understanding. How be it in malice be ye children, but in understanding be ye men. In other words, don't be like a child. Uh, act like an adult. Amen. Amen? That's what it's talking about there. And, um, and so in Ephesians 4.31, listen to this verse. Let all bitterness, all, not some, and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Well, here he is saying, I want you to put it off. I want you to put it off. I want you, want you to get rid of it because what it's going to do now, many, you, you, it's going to mess you up. And church, it's going to mess you up. Get rid of that stuff. Amen? If you're having, if you're having anger with uh, anger problems or you're having problems with malice, uh, how about this one? Uh, there's the sin of blasphemy. Now, that's not talking about the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. That's a whole different thing. That word blasphemy there, you know what it means? It means the speech that slanders, insults, hurts, injures, 
shows contempt. It is railing at someone. I mean, it is beating them up, uh, just tearing their character apart. That's what that word blaspheme. And you and Paul again. He is dealing with a local church. I deal with it every, almost every week uh, of my life. And almost every week, sometimes we have testimony services, and, and it just happens. It, I, I, it's not anything I pump up. It, it, if it happens, it happens. And I have seen, I have seen people stand and, 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 and get things right with people in the church. Amen? Yeah. You got something... Got some, some rubbing you just wrong. Go over to them and say, "Look, hadn't spoken to you in a week. I'm sorry." Amen. And uh, shake their hand. You ladies hug one re- one another's neck. Yeah, that's what we need to do to have revival in our churches. To be able to pray like we should. That there it is. It's it's very plain. Hmm insults, hurts. I preached a six-week meeting in one church in no, uh, Asheboro, North Carolina. And um, first week I was there, I preached on what you're mad about. That's what I started Sunday school with. What you mad about? Person stood and said, I'm not mad at I'm not mad about anything. I said, Oh, good. One lady stood and said, Brother Beckham, you don't need to preach that around here. I said, Oh, okay. But I preached it anyway. Amen. And guess who stood at the end of that first week? She did. Crying like a baby. Brother Beckham, I am so sorry. <laughs> Yes, ma'am. And? I just found out I was mad, too. I knew that when you opened your mouth on Sunday morning. I love you. I always, always let them know I love them. Amen. And, uh, you know, I go back there every year, and, and there she is sitting on the back row with a big old smile. But that morning, she didn't have a smile. She could have killed someone that morning. She could have turned into a serial killer. I mean, that's the way she looked. I mean, she was pitiful. I didn't, hey, I wanted to walk around the church and, and not go by her. Uh, it was that bad, I'm telling you. But now she's got the sweetest little smile. She's in her 80s, you know. But, you know, when you get to 70 years old, you ought to be able to uh, get over some of this stuff. I can, I can kind of uh, put up with a 14-year-old. Or maybe even a 20-year-old. But when you get to a certain age, you should be, you should be able to get over this stuff. Amen? Yeah. Put it off, Paul says. Why? Because you're risen with Christ. That's the reason. Get over it. And then look at the next one. There's the sin of filthy communication. Huh. Hmm. You know what that is? Filthy words coming out of your mouth, cuss words. Huh. In 207, I bought, I bought a um, 207 F-150, beautiful truck. And um, I pulled up in the parking lot, and I saw this custom-painted Dodge Ram, custom painted, beautiful truck. And I thought, well, it looks new. I'm going to park my truck right by it. Because he, he had it parked way out where no one could hit it and all this stuff. Well, <laughs> he and his wife got in a fight on the way to church. And they said words that they shouldn't say. And um, he let her, you know, pout and do, you know, do do what the ladies do sometimes. But he needed. But all he was doing was pouting too. See, we blame all this mess upon the ladies, but really it's us most of the time. Amen. 
And uh, if it wasn't for us, they wouldn't be pouting. Yeah. Uh-huh. Aren't we having fun? Amen. Amen. So, well, I waited, and I went in kind of late. And you, you, you can learn a lot by walking in a foyer of an independent church. Southern Baptist, I don't know nothing about. But um, independent Baptist, I know a lot about us. I've been one of us for 54 years. And, and so I walked in the foyer, and there was this group of ladies standing there. And I heard one say, I cannot believe what I just heard that sister so-and-so did. Well, I stopped because I needed some sermon material. And, and so I stopped and my ear went mm-hmm, right up in the middle of them. And, I, and I, got, I got loaded down with introduction, po- main point, 10 sub points at point one. Boy, I got, I got a sermon. I cannot believe she did that. And I said, okay, say what she, tell me what she did. And, and so I got a little closer. And my ear got a little closer, and all of a sudden, I heard what she did. Well, you know what she did? She took her keys, custom painted, Dodge Ram truck. At that time, probably $50,000. Huh? Whew. And she didn't just do a little bit at the bumper, she went from front to back on both sides to the metal. So I thought, I know, that has to be some young married couple. So I got in the pulpit and I was talking about, and you can, you can tell body language, you touch on certain things and people's heads go down. Amen. See, we're not, we're not, I'm not a psychic or anything, uh, but I, I can read body language. Love you. Okay. And, and so I, I started preaching, and it wasn't in the 20-year-olds. So I, I started watching with the 30 years old, and the 40s, and the 50s, and the 60s. And I got to the 70s. And I said, cut. Do you believe this? He said, go ahead, Brother Beckham, preach. I said, but I can't believe this. He said, go ahead and preach. How did I know? Here, here's, here she is sitting in the pew. And I said, we are not to have temper tantrums in the parking lot. I didn't say nothing but that. Them little beady eyes looking right at me. I said, Father, I need help. Calm her down because I got a 207 brand new F-150 sitting right by the truck that she just burnt. Amen. Well, bless her heart, she got right with the Lord. And my truck was okay. But I couldn't believe that a 74-year-old, they must have been married 50 years at least, and they would do such a thing. And the language that came out of her mouth. Well, God says, since you're saved, put off all that stuff. Amen. Our mouths should be clean. Amen. Yeah. I mean, your heads are going down. Yeah. So in closing, I thought I would get all a lot of amens on that one. But in closing tonight, you know, if I didn't put humor in this message, it would choke us to death. You know, it would, wouldn't it? This is tough stuff. 
But I tell stories that actually has happened to me in meetings. I have heard testimonies. I've heard I've heard all kinds blowing up at one and all this stuff, going to bed, waking up, finding their mate dead next to them. I, uh, all kinds of stories, true stories. Hard stories. And you never know. So, since you have been risen with Christ, you might be here and you might be guilty of not seeking. You may be guilty tonight of not being focused. You may be here tonight, you're just a church member. That's all you are. You don't do anything other than come to church. Don't even read your Bible like you should. And you certainly don't mortify, and, and you may have some of this stuff in your life. Nothing surprises me. I've had pastors to stand before their church and turn around and say, Brother Beckham, I'm guilty, sir. I'm addicted. Church, I'm addicted. Pornography. I've heard pastor after pastor after pastor do that. And in most of those churches, revival broke out. In one church, pastor had to get right with the Lord, and he had 25 men to stand publicly. And that church wasn't used to that. They wasn't used to coming to the altar. They wasn't, And the preacher even told me, he said, Brother Beckham, I know you're used to seeing people come to the altar and doing things, but you can't expect this church to do that. But for, for six weeks, they did that. We started at 7 every night, and it was 10, 30, 11, 30, 12, 30, before we ever got out. 25 men confessed to pornography. Three former pastors got saved in that meeting. One of them brought a bag, a garbage bag, full of liquor and pornography and drugs and threw it in a trash can that the preacher had up front. Yeah. But revival broke out. It was wonderful. It was wonderful. So you may be here tonight and you may have pornography in your life. I'm going to tell you how to get victory over it. How I have seen men and ladies to get victory over it. Now listen carefully. It's not, it's nothing unique. But here, here's a good way to do it. Confess it to God. Paul deals with confessing things to God. And then he deals with confessing things before the church, before all the terminology that he used. Paul said, confess your sins before all. See, it's one thing to come to the altar and you and God talk about it, and that sounds wonderful. But if you'll, everyone I have ever heard confess it and become accountable to their church they stick with it. Almost everyone I ever have known. But people that gets lost in the crowd up here and they they go back and they be right back doing it again within a week or two. And a lot of times it's not a week or two. It's a day or two. But all of those 25 families, those men, their pastors said they got strong marriages now. Good, good, strong um, Christian lives, but that's a good way to get rid of, get rid of it. Just come, come clean, come clean with it. You say, well, well, what if the church talks about me? What if, not if they, church won't talk about you, if the church is what she should be. Amen. Your church will get behind you. Your church will hold you up. Amen. Alcohol is the same way. Drugs. Just just come clean. 
is say, Lord, church, I'm sorry. You said, well, Brother Beckham, is it important? Of course it is. You remember the story of Agin in the Bible? He hid it. He hid that sin in that tent. Instead of confessing it before the Lord, he hid the thing. And do you remember God cursed the whole nation of Israel because of that one man hiding his sin? And see, the church is a body. We're a family. We're a body. We are made up of eyes and ears and arms. Amen. And every one of us are important. There is no unimportant person in this room. Everybody is important. You might be a nose. One man said, I'm nothing but a nose. Well, cut your nose off and see how you function. You're important to this body. Even the hairs in your nose is important. Amen? Yeah. Everything. Well, I'm just a finger. Well, you cut that finger off and see how you can function with that hand without that finger. That finger plays a great part in picking up stuff and gripping stuff. And without that finger, that hand does not function properly. And so if you've got sin in your life, you're, you're putting the church in a predicament that God can't bless because you're a part of the body. So when you confess it, then you're freeing, freeing the Lord up to be able to bless you. Amen? And you want to be a praying church. I, I can see that. You believe in prayer. I know you do. You believe in good preaching. You believe in this book. But sin can mess it up. It can mess it up. So since we are just family here, you may want tonight to just confess it before the Lord, of course. Get it, get it okay with the church and start tomorrow or start tonight when you get home, when you're throwing that mess out the door, whatever it is. Amen? Getting rid of it. You'll feel so much better. I guarantee you. So as our musicians comes, and, um, and as we stand, and if you need to come to the altar, don't let the devil say, the church is going to talk about you. The church is going to look down on you. The church is, a, don't you listen to the devil now. Because the devil, let me tell you about the devil, he's a liar. He's a liar. 